And you too are all quite free to believe that a sentient creator deliberately, consciously put himself, a being, put himself or herself or itself to the trouble of going through huge epochs of birth and death of species over eons of time, 99% in the course of which at least 99.9% .9 of all species, all life forms ever to have appeared on Earth have become extinct. But there came a time, probably about 180,000 years ago, when due to a terrible climatic event, probably in Indonesia, a, an appalling global warming crisis occurred. And the, the estimate is that the number of humans in Africa went down to between 40 and 30,000. This close, this close, think about fine tuning, <laughs> this close to joining every other species that had gone extinct. And that's our Exodus story, is that somehow we don't know how, because it's not written in any scripture, it's not told in any book, it's not part of any superstitious narrative, but somehow the escape from Africa to cooler latitudes was made. But that's how close it was. You have to be able to imagine that all this mass extinction and death and randomness is the will of a being. You're, you're, you are absolutely free to believe that if you wish. And all of this should happen so that one very imperfect race of evolved primates should have the opportunity to become Christians or to turn up at this gym tonight. That all of, the, all of that was done with us in view. It's a curious kind of solipsism. It's a curious kind of self-centeredness. I was always brought up to believe that Christians were modest and, and humble and comported themselves with, with due humility. And this, there's a certain arrogance to this assumption that all of this, all of this extraordinary development was all about us. And we were the intended and designed result, and everything else was in the discard. The tremendous wastefulness of it, the tremendous cruelty of it, the tremendous caprice of it, the tremendous tinkering and incompetence of it, never mind, at least we're here. If there was an entity that was responsible for the beginning of the cosmos, and that also happened to be busily engineering the very laborious product, production of life on our little planet, um, it still wouldn't prove that this entity cared about us answered prayers, cared what church we went to, or whether we went to one at all, cared who we had sex with, or in what position, or by what means, cared what we ate, or on what day, uh, cared whether we lived or died. There's no reason at all why this entity isn't completely indifferent to us. Um, you cannot get from deism to theism, except by a series of extraordinarily generous to yourself um, assumptions. The deist has all his work still ahead of him to show that it leads to revelation, uh, to redemption, uh, to salvation, or to suspensions of the natural order, in which hitherto you've been putting all your faith, all your evidence is on scientific and natural evidence, or why not, for a change of pace and a change of taste, say yes, but sometimes this same natural order, which is so miraculous, but the, it's randomly suspended when miracles are required. So with, with, with uh, caprice and contempt, these laws turn out not to be so important after all, as long as the truth of religion can be proved by their being rendered inoperative. This is having it both ways, in the most promiscuous and exorbitant manner, in my submission. I have to say that um, I appear as a skeptic who believes that doubt is the great engine, the great fuel of all inquiry, all discovery, and all innovation, and that I doubt these things. The disadvantage, it seems to me, in the, in the argument goes to the person who says, no, I know, I know it, it must be true, it is true. Uh, we are too early in the study of physics and biology, it seems to me, to be dealing in certainties of that kind, especially when the stakes are so high. It seems to me extraordinary claims, such as the existence of a, of a divine power with a son who cares enough to come and redeem us, extraordinary claims require truly extraordinary evidence. But you see where this lands you, ladies and gentlemen, with the Christian apologetic. You're told you're a miserable sinner who is without excuse. You're, you've disappointed your God in whom, who made you, and it, uh, you've been so ungrateful as to rebel. You're contemptible, you're worm-like, but you can take heart. The whole universe was designed with just you in mind. These two claims are not just mutually exclusive, but I think they are intended to compensate each other's cruelty and ultimately um, absurdity. In other words, evidence is an occasional convenience. Seek and ye shall find. I remember being told that in church many a time as a young lad. Seek and ye shall find. I thought it was a sinister injunction because it's all too likely to be true. We are pattern-seeking mammals and primates. 
if we uh, can't get good evidence, we'll go for junk evidence. If we can't get a real theory, we'll go with a conspiracy theory. You see it all the time. Religion's great strength is that it was the first of our attempts to explain reality, to, to make those patterns take some kind of form. It deserves credit. It was our first attempt at astronomy, our first attempt at cosmology, in some ways our first attempt at medicine, our first attempt at literature, our first attempt at philosophy. Good. While, while there was nothing else, it had many uh, functional uses of that kind. Never mind that they didn't know that germs cause disease, maybe evil spirits cause disease, maybe disease is a punishment. Never mind that they believed in astrology rather than astronomy. Even Thomas Aquinas believed in astrology. Never mind that they believed in devils. Never mind that they, things like volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, tidal waves were thought of as punishments, not as natural occurrences on the cooling crust of a, of a planet. The pattern seeking has gone too far, and it's gone, I think, much too far with what was until recently thought of as Christianity's greatest failure, greatest of all failures, cosmology. The one thing Christianity knew nothing about and taught the most abject nonsense about. The, 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 for most of its lifetime, Christianity taught that the, the Earth itself was the center of the universe, and we had been given exclusive dominion as a species over it. Could not have been more wrong. How are we going to square the new cosmology, the fantastic new discoveries in physics with the old dogmas? Well, one is the idea of this fine tuning. This is essentially another form of pattern seeking on the basis of extremely limited evidence. Most physicists are very uncertain, as they have every right to be. In fact, I would say for physicists that as they have the duty to be at the moment, extremely uncertain about the spatio-temporal dimensions of the original episode, the Big Bang as it's sometimes called. We're in the very, very early stages of this inquiry. We hardly know what we don't know about the origins of the universe. Uh, it's, we're viewing it from an unimaginable distance, not just an unimaginable distance in space. We're perched on a tiny rock in an extremely small suburb of a fairly minor galaxy, trying to look to discern our origins, but also at an un unbelievable distance in time. And we, we claim the right to say, ah, we can see the finger of God in this process. It's an extraordinarily arrogant assumption. It either deserves a Nobel Prize in physics, which it hasn't yet got, I notice. I don't know any physicist who believes these assumptions are necessary, or it deserves a charge of hubris. Was there pre-existing material for this extra spatio-temporal being to work with? Or did he just will it into existence, the ex nihilo? Who designed the designer? Don't you run the risk with the, the presumption of a god and a designer and an originator of asking, well, where does that come from, where does that come from, and locking yourself into an infinite uh, regress? Why are there so many shooting stars, collapsed suns, failed galaxies? We can see. We can see with the aid of a telescope. Sometimes we can see with the, with the naked eye. The, the utter failure, the total destruction of gigantic, unimaginable sweeps of outer space. Is this fine-tuning, or is it uh, extremely random, capricious, uh, cruel, mysterious, um, and incompetent? Have you thought of the nothingness that's coming? We know we have something now, and we speculate about what it might have come from, and there's a real question about ex nihilo, but nihilo is coming to us. Uh, in the night sky, you can already see the Andromeda galaxy. It's heading straight for ours on a collision course. Is that part of a design? Was it fine-tuned to do that? Uh, we know that from the, from the red light shift of the Hubble telescope, or rather Edwin Hubble's original discovery, the universe is expanding away from itself at a tremendous rate. It was thought that rate would go down for Newtonian reasons. No, uh, it's recently been proved by Professor Lawrence Krauss. The rate of expansion is increasing. Everything is exploding away even faster. Nothingness is certainly coming. Who designed that? Uh, and that's all if, if before uh, these things happen, we don't have the destruction of our own little solar system, in which already there's only one planet where anything like life can possibly be supported. All the other planets are too hot or too cold to support any life at all, and the sun is due to swell up, burn us to a crisp, boil our oceans and die, as we've seen all the other suns do in the night sky. This is not fine-tuning, ladies and gentlemen, and if it's, if it's the work of a designer, then there's an indictment to which that designer may have to be subjected. I'm out of time. I'm very grateful for your kindness and hospitality. Thank you.